Uh, my name is Kimberly King Burns, and I head up Convergent Solutions, which is a di digital media brokerage here in Burbank that's been in place since 1995, and we've grown any number of uh, digital music and film and education technology companies over the last some odd years. Today's conversation is specific to TV and film and video with regard to strategies and partnerships, extending Hollywood content as a brand and as a dis distribution package. We've got an esteemed panel for you today, but before we get started, we'd like to get a sense of who's who in the audience. Uh, do we have content developers? Please raise your hand. Perfect. Uh, do we have uh, services providers? Any anywhere from CPA to, to legal to business development, content development? Yes. Perfect. And uh, how about senior level studio execs? Because we, we tend to mix it up. All right. Today's conversation will focus on um, the different marketplaces that have evolved since the evolution of the internet with regard to diversity and uh, distribution platforms beyond uh, the model that your grandparents may have grown up with. On today's panel, we'd like to introduce uh, Ed Rivero, is uh, executive producer of Havoc Content, uh, the Cortez Brothers. Uh, Falayo Lasaki, next door, uh, heads up Soul Pancake, which is a division of participant media. Uh, Larry Namer is the, um, sorry, I, did mean, I didn't mean to skip, but uh, Larry Namer is the head of Metan Global, Global Entertainment. And Rachel Meskin is the director of editorial, video, and social uh, for Gamma Ray. Stuart McLean, who I unfortunately skipped over, uh, is the founder and president of Content and Company. So today, what we're going to focus on in a nutshell are strategies for standing out in a saturated market, how best to increase consumer and corporate recall and brand awareness, developing and continuing a strong viral media conversation, uh, taking on new product lines from merchandising to extending uh, into different verticals, and increasing awareness and branding and sales across continually evolving demographics. So today, uh, what I'd like to do is to introduce our uh, writers and directors and producers on the panel and have them give you a quick synopsis of their background one by one. Ed, would you like to start? Sure, sure. My name is Ed Rivero. I am um, um, I'm from New York and from Miami. I worked uh, five years for Ridley Scott. Um, I was their international EP. And before that, I worked in television news, documentaries, most of the traditional media. Within the last, I would say, nine years, I've made the transition into all kinds of, uh, from promos to digital to uh, EPKs to, you know, um, all kinds of media. And it really depends on the format and uh, the scale of the job, which is what we, we discussed. I look at every job from, not necessarily from the distribution aspect of it, but from any lens, which is what they're asking us to do. It's no longer just one take. You know, you're, you're doing it for, for different formats. Good. Laya. Hi, uh, my name is Falayo Lasaki. I'm actually the head of marketing of Soul Pancake. Very important I gave, distinction. I gave you a boost. I know, I got a promotion. <laughs> my boss would be so thrilled to find out. Um, so I oversee the marketing at Soul Pancake, and that's everything from um, brand marketing, working with our uh, PR team and strategy on that, content marketing, uh, distribution strategy, um, and anything under the sun that falls on, under the uh, marketing wheelhouse from events to social and all of those things. So uh, I got my background in independent film uh, and then moved into the digital world about five or six years ago, essentially just knowing that uh, if you're paying attention, the way consumers were consuming content was changing and uh, I wasn't as familiar with that area and I wanted to make sure that I had all my ducks in a row, so to speak. Uh, and uh, Soul Pancake was acquired by Participant Media in 2016 
Uh, and so that is a film production company that is responsible for Spotlight, The Help, Roma, Green Book, amongst other things. Um, and so I ended up sort of back in the indie film world after all. So nice to meet you all. Thank you. Stuart. Hi, I'm uh, Stuart McLean. I've been in the branded entertainment space longer than I would care to admit. Um, for I, I grew up at the big agencies in New York at J. Walter Thompson, Young and Rubicam, and came out here about 10 years ago and started Content and Company. It's really specializing in brand financing, doc films, web series, television shows. Uh, Content and Company was acquired by Sia Media about a year ago. And uh, I continue to trundle down uh, the brand entertainment path and help brands uh, finance productions. Um, and most recently, I've also gotten into the software business to help uh, media channels expand to all the different platforms that everyone needs to get out to now as well. Perfect. Larry Namer. Uh, hi, uh, Larry Namer. Uh, past life founder of E! Entertainment TV. So. If you want to complain about the Kardashians, you can start <laughs> booing now. Uh, but for the past, I sold the company to Comcast, and I've been focused on Asia, particularly China, for the past number of years. Um, we have a media company there. We do TV, film. We do branded content. We do live events. Um, but probably in the last six months with the trade war going on and things slowing down a bit in China, um, I myself have focused a little more on doing stuff in the U.S., which I promised myself I wasn't going to do anymore, but I've got some shows over at Vice and Netflix and something over at Amazon now, so I'm, I'm back in the U.S. Um, I'm Rachel Meskin. I oversee our editorial video and social content for Gamma Ray, which is a startup within Skybound Entertainment. <laughs> Um, I, this is my first startup. Prior to this, I'm used to bigger companies and nonprofits. Um, my last stint was at Nickelodeon for years, and I worked with the Smithsonian and several other smaller nonprofits. Um, and so I've been in the digital space for about 13 years, focusing on all different kinds of education, entertainment, and just marketing content on all platforms. That's perfect. So we've got a, a well rounded panel for today's discussion. Um, let's talk to the fact that. Uh, the advent of digital media um, has uh, rather reduced Hollywood to more of a state of mind than a location. How has that impacted not only the stories that you create for other markets, but how is that impacting how you approach distribution of those kinds of projects? And who would you like to go first? I think you've got some good stories. Well, I mean, getting back to um we're more or less almost like a line production company at this point. We get, um, we work directly with brands, so they approach us, and then from the inception of the concept, uh, then we have to try to figure out how we're going to, what is the distribution is going to be with them. So it's very different. So when I'm, I think what I was more getting into is that you know for the longest time Hollywood had to appeal to the lowest common denominator. I'm from the Bahamas, so I grew up with a Hollywood who presumed that the entire Caribbean was Jamaican. Right. You know, and reggae was the only music we listened to. Correct. And nobody looked like me. Whereas it's a, it's a, you know, a fantastic region of many colonial and indigenous influences that uh, Caribbean storytellers are now finally beginning to take advantage of because there's a diaspora of expats around the world that will pay to see that kind of content. And then there are people that have visited the region that like to revisit it in film and media as well. So how has that impacted some of the content development that you pursue? How is it tailoring your approach? How is it expanding your opportunities for funding? Well, you know, from, from, where, from where I sit, you know, I think what's interesting is the ability to go a little more niche, but um, now whenever we're looking at a property, because you can't just set, set up at a network anymore because they're on the reach, so we look at everything um, as a, as almost as a modular development. So we have our tent pole half hour or film, or that might be, and you know, what are all the different bits and pieces that can spin off so that we can actually get the scale that you want. So the promise of niche is great, so you can go really deep, you can be really engaging, but you still need to be able to get scale. Um, so we go. Yeah. Um, I would say for us, because Soul Pancake is uh, 
and soul pa the combination of Soul Pancake and, and Participant touches all of the screens, both the little ones and the big ones. Okay. So I think for us, um, one of the things with digital is sort of the democratization of, of storytelling. And so in terms of being able to tell content from different places, on the Soul Pancake side, uh, we're looking for an authenticity in the stories. So being able to go directly to those places. So if it is in the Bahamas, like speaking to Bahamian? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, speaking to uh, a Bahamian <laughs> person um, and being able to have that story reflect the world as they see it as opposed to the world that you know media has told us exists. And I think that that goes um, that goes into you know socioeconomic. I think that goes into representation on screen and representation behind the screen. That's something that's very important to us as well. So I think um, digital in general. You know, we distribute primarily on on YouTube and Facebook. We've got an audience of about four and a half million across those two platforms. And I think because those are global platforms, it also keeps us honest. Because mm -hmm. if we're not um, one of the beauty parts of that digital beauty parts, uh, is that people will tell you when you're wrong. It's the beauty of the comment section, so it's great. And that's a really good point, because I think a lot of the networks don't typically anticipate the kind of response they're going to have around the world. Uh, when Shondaland first premiered Scandal, it took them about two weeks to realize that their biggest social media community was in the Caribbean. It was bigger than that of the US, because everybody had an opinion that they were more than willing to um, evoke, because social media is a new communications platform for so many second and third world uh, economies that you know, haven't been able to participate in the conversation this actively. How are you finding it's um, driving your strategy? You've been at this for a while. <laughs> yeah, real long time. Uh, in, in Asia, particularly in China, uh, the market's pretty unusual because a lot of brands are just finding their way into the market, so people haven't developed consumer habits, so there's still a lot of money flowing from the brands to do that. The people who have money in China are 25 to 40. There's no money below it. There's no money above it. So what you really have is brands that have now come to accept that if they want to reach people who can buy their product, they have to put money into digital media. Mm. Um, so we, we kind of hone in on that 25 to 40 uh, thing. We develop a lot of stuff for brands. Uh, the nice part about um, d doing stuff in China is you have a massive uh, audience and, and stuff. And you know anybody above 25 and under 40 is typically watching on the cell phone now. About 60% of our audience for our stuff is on cell phone mm -hmm. now. And we combine commerce opportunities to literally everything we do. The last big show we had there, we um, one of the, the gals in the show wore great shoes. Um, we actually hired a shoe designer uh, and we uh, bought a shoe factory and we made more money selling shoes than we actually made on the license for the show. <laughs> Truth. Um, so the dynamics are different there. You know, if you take your ego away and you decide you don't want to win Emmy Awards or Academy Awards, you just want to make money, there's a huge opportunity there. And are you extending your footprint to include, uh, uh, you know, media like WeChat and uh, the Tata back, back Yeah, we, we the, again, the nice part there is the market's so, so new to a lot of stuff. When we do planning, because there's no legacy stuff, it's not like here where if you're dealing with Fox, you got to deal with AT&T, and if you're dealing with another channel, you got to deal with, you know, T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. There, there's no legacy technologies, and there's no legacy deals, so you're pretty much wide open. So when we design a content project, we literally look at it from every single angle out there. So we do, you know, what's our WeChat approach and mm -hmm. all of that stuff right, right from the very beginning. The nice part is when you do it that way, it's seamless. So it actually ties through your content without sure. looking like it was kind of forced into the content. Not shoehorned in. Rachel, how are you finding the, this opportunity to tailor your content for your specific markets? Um, I think there's two pieces to this. The first piece is that when you're dealing with the ultra snackable short form content that you don't have to put in as huge of a budget. 
And so you can kind of disperse your voice, disperse your yeah. like brand awareness among many campaigns. And so you can bring on influencers that reflect a diverse audience. You can bring on writers, editors for each individual short form piece. Mm -hmm. And that enables you to reach a wider audience with more specific targeting based on the messages that we're trying to put out. And the other piece to it is also about targeting, which is that unlike traditional media where you have this product and you need to invest you need to you finish the product and then move it over to the marketing team who then needs to figure out how to dis distribute it, what the like audience research is like, what the analytics are like after the product is completed. Mm -hmm. With our digital work, we don't have a creative meeting unless there's a paid an uh, there's, a, there's a marketing analyst and a paid distribution expert in the room. And we don't have a marketing meeting unless there's creatives in the room. So those two have become intrinsically linked. And that's a good, that's a really good tack to take because that hasn't been the case in the past. But my question to the panel is, uh, you know, the holy grail of data analytics. Who's on first? Who's actually really doing it? Uh, we've got these niche markets for the taking, but is Hollywood being you people, <laughs> really taking advantage of targeting that market, or are we being led by an audience that seems to have a never-ending appetite for blockbusters? Where's the balance? Mr. Rivera. There's no, I mean, there's no more borders. I mean, uh, it, I happen to have specialized for a long time in Latin America, which is now, you know, Netflix is spending 500 million bucks in Yay. Mexico. Finally, yes. So for that particular market, we're seeing even uh, American producers uh, creating content for Mexico from here. Mm -hmm. That never existed. So it's opening all kinds of opportunities and the same thing's happening in Spain, Portugal, the Caribbean. I mean, hopefully it'll start happening in towns, in the, you know, sections of the, of the country, which I think that, that will be, it would be that niche. Um, so those are opportunities. Uh, you know, because we're all from some place, mm -hmm. we all want to tell those stories. We want to tell those stories. And this is definitely an opportunity for the, the content developers here. And you, have what do um, you think? From uh, the data perspective, I think, ultimately, I think it's still being driven by audience. And I think one thing that's been very interesting about how the industry has shifted over the last, you know, decade or so, um, is that, it, or more than that, I guess I would say, when, when I was growing up, um, media was telling me what to be interested in, mm -hmm. and that's how it was yeah. shifting. And I think now media is catching up to the people. You know, the people are saying what cool is, and then we're trying to find the data to be like, okay, this is what cool is. Hack it. What does that mean? So I think um, what we have with data and what we have with all these social media platforms is a way to uh, listen to what's going on in the world and re reflect accordingly. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think the, the audience is on first. And I think data, um, data's you know, right here. And then the data and creative kind of have to live together in the same space because data can only tell you so much. You still need story and craft to shape around it from, from that side. I think, uh, I, I don't think that the world is being dominated by blockbusters. I just think that blockbusters look amazing on a very large screen and mm -hmm. it's also the most interesting press story. But I think that if you're looking at the consumption habits on the OTT platforms and on digital platforms, people are just craving these amazing stories. I think, um, you know, Netflix is this, you know, behemoth of a content area. And if you look at how niche everything gets in there, they wouldn't continue to do that. They wouldn't spend all this money if there was literally nobody the watching. So I think that um, it's- They have the data. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, have the data. They, they, won't the give, data. they won't give anybody else the data, but they certainly but they have, the, have data. the data. And when you're seeing, um, you know, content from, from India on the rise, or you're seeing, mm -hmm. you know, Asian countries, um, content on the rise or Latin American countries on the rise um, on these on Netflix I think if you're paying attention you can sort of see shifts in the industry if you just start looking at like what's trending on Netflix you're like oh really interesting and you're making a really good point yeah. that producers have turned into curators mm -hmm. you know exactly. so how is that informing some of the decisions that you're making well, I, I, you know, I think data, I see a lot of data paralysis out there, you know, and I, I, wor I worry about that. Um, 
You know, certainly from helping marketers get out, and it, we spend a lot of our time just helping them experiment. It's almost like you have to plant a little bit of a garden and see what sprouts up, because if you spend too much time uh, checking the data points and trying to aggregate all the data where everyone is, you're never going to make anything at the end of the day. I, I agree. You have to have a good story. You have to take some leaps of faith. Um, and with that, I'm always surprised with the best, play, best laid plans. It always takes a right hand turn or a left hand turn that you don't expect. And something is much bigger than, than the team usually you know, could, thinks could happen. So I think you know, taking data with a grain of salt is good in the creative businesses. Yeah. <clears throat> what, uh, well, we look at stuff, we, we program to um, people, people of common interest as opposed to geographic borders. So um, now with digital, the way it is, with very few exceptions, you, you can come up with a show for women who crochet. Uh, if you just looked at the, the audience in the U.S., you'd say it's too small to sustain it. But if you looked at women who crochet across the globe, with the exception of China that doesn't let everything in, uh, you, you could make economic sense out of really focusing in and becoming, let, let's, I call it super serving audiences of, of common interest and, and stuff. And that's really really the way we look at stuff. That's a good point. What, what do you think is the opportunity now for sponsored content? Because we've really gone through a 20-year arc from BMW Films 1.0, maybe 15, 20 years ago. We keep hearing tropes about the death of television, uh, but it's an admirably tenacious medium it's not going anywhere. Consumption is up, as has been pointed out. There is a prolifer proliferation of a devices to take advantage of. Um, you know, competition from Netflix is really um, gender engendering uh, some terrific innovation. So how are we working here to say, um, not necessarily go back to ad-supported commercial media, but how can we move beyond the classic, you know, father, your father's Oldsmobile model of leveraging classic brands. What, are, what can we do differently to engender the next generation? Well, I, I mean, I could talk to something that we've done in China and stuff, which I, I think applies. So, and, and again, the industry is, is fairly new there, so you don't have a lot of legacy deals that you've got to okay. figure out how to break down. So, um, Bacardi, the liquor company, they realize Chinese people like to drink, but yet there's no history of mixed drinks in China. So we created uh, a show for that, digital show for them. I call it Friends Meets Big Bang Theory. In the show, um, one of the kids, Jerry, decides to go to bartender school. And that's important because in China, bartending has never been a profession, so we had to get that point across. So you can never get that, that many messages across in a 30-second commercial, so we designed 10 episode um, sitcoms, half hours. And in the show, Jerry comes home and he says, today I learned Bloody Marys, guess what? There's no blood in the Bloody Mary. Uh, but in the show, he never makes a drink. But when we filmed those shows, we took Jerry aside and he did a 10 minute tutorial on every mixed drink possible. So if you go to Bacardi website in China, there's Jerry, whose credibility we've established in the TV show, now teaching you how to make mixed drinks and then take it one step further, if Bacardi is gonna be the liquor provider for a new restaurant in Shanghai, we actually have Jerry go to the restaurant and he signs autographs and stuff. So we, monet we create the character in one medium and then we monetize them across okay. every way we can possibly do it. Uh, a show like that, Bacardi paid 100% of the production cost mm. uh, to do it and we, we guaranteed 18 million viewers. The show actually was pretty good and delivered 53 million. So they, they want us to write season two, but I can't write that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Rachel. Um, so we actually consider ourselves a content creator studio, a curation platform, and a marketing agency all rolled into one. And so a lot of what we do is branded partnership content. Mm. And so that includes both short form and longer form digital series that are sponsorable. Like we have a show called Popcraft, where we make a variety of different pop culture icons in a variety of different media. Um, and that's very sponsorable for, because if we had a studio that wanted to promote a new movie, for example, we could create that character using, we did, um, we did a, um, a, a Mission Impossible like gunpowder portrait at one point, for example. 
And we also develop from the ground up series that are fully integrated with a branded partner, like we have a ramen noodle campaign coming up, and it's a hilarious game show. Um, and so I think that the concept of television has shifted. Television isn't going anywhere. Content isn't going anywhere. Everybody needs stories of all different lengths. But the way that those stories are told across platforms and the numbers that we consider successful have shifted. Um, another interesting platform case study that we have is that Twitch is trying to expand out of just the individual gaming streamer mm. niche that they do. And so we partnered with Celestial um, to create a live streaming kung fu movie marathon. And it had two and a half million viewers, which by traditional television, numbers is not that great but for us it was a huge success because it was a new opportunity for twitch it was a new opportunity for us and it had a very engaged audience having a live conversation with us while watching kung fu movies kung fu movies and we were all so excited about it we're definitely going to be doing it again and so these things are shifting but that doesn't mean that the content itself is changing or going away perfect and now we've got smartphones which have largely conditioned you know several generations of audience to an immediate uh, call and response. I mean, they're, they're used to instant gratification. So this is an opportunity uh, rather than a curse. And, you know, a world ruled by mobile phones is an on-demand world. And as Falaya mentioned, they've, they've gone from uh, empowered to entitled. Mm -hmm. So how do we as content developers work within that? Because obviously you've got to pay the bills. And so whether that's a bit of sponsored content or um, not, you're breaking the fundamental economic model. So what, moving forward, is something that you would advise content developers to take into consideration as they drive into these different niche markets? In terms of, sorry, I just want to clarify the question. In terms of um, how to work with brands while, uh, while going into the niche market? Or yeah, because I mean, I think we've, we've heard the audience loud and clear. They don't like being hit over the head with, you know, Here's my can of Coke. So we've had to go back toward that more subtle BMW film model where it's just incidental. Yeah. And then you figure out the revenue model on the back end, kind of the way radio did. Yeah. I mean, I think for us, uh, we've always been a company that leads with entertainment. Um, and I think as long as you are giving your audience what they came for, if they came for a story, give them a story. Um, if there is if there's a brand behind it also just don't try to hide it nobody's like don't 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 pretend like there's no brand that ever came here everybody understands that the people making the content that you want to watch also have to pay their own bills and there is this sense across the content space where people do want things for free and and if they're not going to get it for free that's fine but um if they're watching something for free they just they still want to be entertained. Mm -hmm. They still want the story to be the thing that, that moves it forward. So if BMW is paying for your story and everybody in the series seems to be driving a BMW on the way to that restaurant that they work at, you're like, well, that's weird and doesn't make sense. But um, I think as long as you are still giving them something where they're like, but the story was great, the characters were great, the emotion that I felt while watching it was still very real, then I think you're fine. And we've also found with some of the branded content, um, and there are a lot of digital companies that do this well, they don't, they don't pretend to a point where it's almost laughable. And I think that goes back to the fact that brands have to take themselves a lot less seriously than they did at one point. Specifically, if you're working with influencers, if you're working with um, creators who have audiences that understand that creator and there, there's a relationship there. Brands can't come in and try to co-opt that relationship and say, oh, that's not in our brand voice. It's like, trust me on this a little bit. Like, I know, I know what my audience will respond to. I wouldn't work with you if they weren't going to like you. And that goes back just to making sure that whoever you're working with, make sure you would actually work with them, just generally speaking. And it sounds as though it points to actual skill because nobody For sure. in the entire franchise history of James Bond has ever complained about it being virtually a, a PR industry for English brands. If you do it subtly enough, it's captivating. People come back for the story. And whether long form or, sh or short form, that's your opportunity here. But it's, it seems as though that's gotten off to a clunky start. 
Well, I, just to, I think one thing for the, the content creators in the room <clears throat> is, is, is you need to give the brand some credit. So we've done, I don't know, 25 fully brand finance series. More than half of our work has no product placement or brand integration in it at all. It's yeah. not really about that. That's so brands have more research on the customer that we all want to create mm -hmm. for than most of the big studios do. And they have really you know, rich um, insights. And when you capture that, there are plenty of ways that you can make a brand happy. Larry's example of shooting extra content so that you can have, um, you know, make, make Bacardi happy with the, the drinks menu, but that's outside of the show is exactly how you do it. You create co-branded opportunities, you create and uh, experiential opportunities. Um, but, but that's where, you know, every time we get pitched, everyone always usually shows up and says, hey, we're gonna open up on the grill of a Ford Mustang. <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 please, don't do that. Um, so brands can be, everyone has the same goal. Brands don't have enough assets. They've got massive marketing budgets and they just wanna connect with the same customer that you do. Um, so when you can harness that and put everyone together on the same page, good things usually come from it. Are you guys looking at like the affinity audience, like the feeling, every, whatever the brand that you're working with, their values kind of aligning exactly with right. the values yeah, of the audience? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Mitchell. Oh, I think, I mean, just to piggyback on that point, you do have to stay true to your brand voice and you do have to make sure that you're working with partners that make sense for the content you're producing. Okay. Um, but the other thing I kind of wanted to piggyback on was the fact that if not only are fans smarter and savvier than people like to give them credit for um, and would be able to tell if something is branded even if you tried to hide, it's illegal not to disclose that your content is sponsored and influencers get in trouble all the time for mm -hmm. not being upfront about that. So there's nothing wrong with having branded, integrated relationships and being completely upfront about it. Fans know that that's where business is thrive and they also know that that's how they're going to get the content that they want. So if you're telling good stories, it's completely okay to be forthcoming and sell out. Perfect. <laughs> this is certainly the case that these are not your, uh, your grandmother's TV commercials. That's part of the fun. So are, are you seeing more of an appetite on the part of your, uh, the producers that you're working with, the content developers that you're working with, or the audiences you're trying to feed? Are they asking you to be more precise in terms of your storytelling? Well, so, listen, as, as, as an old ad guy uh, mm -hmm. uh, that came out here, the, yeah. the, the talent that is now working, willing and wanting to work with brands is unprecedented. I mean, sure. well, you know, 15 years ago, you'd, you'd come out to Los Angeles and just get stopped dead, you know, in, in the lobby of CAA. Now, um, the, the talent pool is great because, look, it's, it's the, the revenue and the, uh, the, the, the metrics on deal making out here has changed so dramatically that everyone has to be on the same side of the table rowing together, it, not an arm wrestling match of you know, what, a, what an endorsement check is gonna look like. So I well, think it's really great. I mean, to your point, narrow casting, you know, being able to pinpoint very specific audiences, I think would open up product placement. I think people just, I, mean, I think the audience in general grew wary of the same 40 brands over and over again. Mm -hmm. But with the advent of you know, ad-based technology platforms where you can pop out a live action object and say you're targeting a Jamaican audience, that can is a can of ting. If it's a German um, audience, it's a can of Heineken where you can like, absolutely populate for that narrow casting. That seems to be something that nobody minds. They do understand the trade-off. They do understand that that has to happen. It's just, I think that with the advent of digital media, we've been able to be uh, we've been able to give advertisers even more ways to reach their audiences with very specific, more narrow precision. Are you finding that to be the case in terms of some of the, the projects that you're putting together? I'm trying to give our content developers ideas for how they can fully package. I mean, we all know the 30 second spot. That, that traditionally was, I mean, I've had to tell stories in six seconds. Yeah. And now campaigns, you know, obviously connected to a storyline. Is, you know, 
six seconds to tell a story. Very difficult. Even I never thought I'd be able to do that. You're having to pull it off. There's a Caribbean music channel that I listen to that does the seven second uh, yeah. vines. And it, they're brilliant because it, it immediately takes you to a time and place and then you move on to the next song. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's made its point. And it carries a storyline. And it carries a storyline because it's in the context of a music channel that's telling these stories. And by the way, we take a break for this. And it works. It just flows. You know, I don't know. I mean, if anything, 15 seconds seems interminable now <laughs> in, in some media. I'm getting three seconds, which is a Three painfully. second requests? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And because no one wants to sit through that. When you're on YouTube and you get that commercial break, no one wants to really sit through that. So they're like, boom. So if it's a good ad, I don't mind sitting through yeah. it, because I, I, I admire the medium. But they're not even ads, they're teasers of an ad. <laughs> oh, <laughs> stay tuned. Yeah. How are you dealing with this overseas? Well, I mean, both overseas and here, what we're finding is because of, you know, the economics of change, it's, you could produce almost for pennies these days. Yeah. And you produce good stuff, is you could really get niche markets, and, and it's really opened up the world to a whole new level of advertisers. I've got a, a show running on Vice now, it's a music show. I mean, we literally broke that show down to like every single scene, what product could possibly be in it and stuff. I mean, we even have a sponsor that makes guitar picks, <laughs> you know, which before you could never make sense out of it, but now right. you can. I think it's just about being savvy, mm -hmm. honestly. Just because if you're at three seconds or you now have to shoot in vertical because you're on Snap or Instagram stories or any of the story platforms, um, I think that you know Quibi, although it hasn't launched yet, will present an entirely new kind of like storytelling and revenue and, and content opportunity. Um, so I think it's paying attention to the platform, play, paying attention um, Kind of what Larry was saying earlier, just into how you can expand the great idea, and it does start with that great idea, um, how you can expand that into different places, whether that is switching up uh, the format, switching up, uh, you know, bringing the talent in real life to make drinks, which is so cool. Um, I think that it's, it's about thinking beyond the obvious and thinking into like the possible because that's where we're at right now is that if you can think it up there's a good chance you can make it happen. I think the only concern we have at the moment is that inevitably someone comes up with a, a fantastic idea that's terribly innovative and then that idea is replicated ad nauseum for three or four seasons at which point at the end of that overexposure everyone is sick of the original concept mm -hmm. and that's too bad. Because I think that there are ways to make, you know, keep content evergreen. And, and as you, uh, one of you mentioned, was specific to Bollywood, you know, taking a tried and true and we thought retro musical asset and in, inserting new life into it um, has been replicated, is being replicated by film commissions around the world now. So there's some ideas that if you um, are able to uh, focus on your brand and you actually know your audience, you can really make it sing. Because, uh, I, I mean, American consumers are a breed apart. Uh, you know, American consumers were raised on 1995 a month, all you can eat internet access. Whereas in the Caribbean, we were still paying 300 a month just for AOL. So it's a different, you know, it, it, depending on how your consumer's been raised, you've got different markets that you can take advantage of. But you just have to be savvy to the fact that. You know, the per capita income in the Dominican Republic is going to be 5000 a year. In Latin America, in Peru, you're lucky if it's, you know, 750 uh, In Haiti, it's 500 And this is per capita per year. So these are people who do consume content, but at their budget level. So it can't be an all-you-can-eat universal feed, which is where our conversation comes to how you are working with your hated word distribution providers, mm -hmm. to affect you know, blockchain platforms that can read where media is being consumed at any given time and seamlessly charge that consumer that amount. Yeah, sometimes they do. I mean, Tempo Network certainly has followed that model to, to good acclaim. But there are, I mean, even in the Bahamas where the per capita income is slightly higher, 8,000, a year, uh, people will pay for the for um, a show that they want to see that reflects their life. Like Eve's Bayou is a really good example, a film that came out about 23 years ago. 
for a lot of people who grew up where I grew up, that was the first black film that showed a middle class family that wasn't redolent with stereotypes. And I mean, even here in LA, there were a number of us that saw it in five cinemas opening weekend just to sweeten the um, opening box office numbers. But they went bonkers around the Caribbean because it was a respectful film. Uh, Diane Carroll's character played an Obia woman that we have a lot of respect for, whereas typically American media sets her up as a witch or off or different. You know, so I think you've got different audiences that we're just, you're just beginning to explore and being able to get a feel for uh, the economics of. I think I'd like to have each of you quickly summarize what you think your biggest challenge is moving forward, and then I'd like to open the, uh, the floor to questions from this pretty terrific audience. Would you like to start? <clears throat> Staying relevant is, uh, is the hardest thing, especially if you, know, you get to a certain point in your age and the younger consumers are digesting this stuff at speeds, like my nine-year-old, he can digest things, uh, and the three-second spot's gonna work for him, because that's about the attention span <laughs> he has. Um, and that's the main problem, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years, so how do I stay relevant and stay in the game? Advertising's not going away, it's just going to change, it, you know, it, it evolve and Good point. blend in. Um, and how do you stay relevant? I mean, even Netflix is changing the film industry. Mm -hmm. The way they tell stories. I mean, you, what, we, what I used to do in two hours, they're doing in nine hours, and they're better at it than, than I could ever think. So that, that, for me, it's the main thing. How do I stay relevant and keep up with the technology at the same time, not get oversaturated, overthinking it, and, you know, and absorbing it? Because you do have to pay attention to what's going on below you and above you. Sure. Um, I think it's kind of an industry-wide challenge is just um, staying focused in order to keep that relevance. Um, I think that there are people that are amazing at things and they move needles and mountains at that thing, but there are uh, there's a new platform that pops up what feels like every 10 minutes. So yes that focus on what you're great at, and not to say that you should never venture into anything else, but I think the challenge is knowing when to deviate from the thing that you're best at to work on this new emerging thing that could be really interesting mm -hmm. versus sometimes uh, understanding that that new thing is gonna be really cool for that company. We're gonna stay in our lane here. And so just knowing, um, when to stay in your lane, and then when to veer off and expand the lane, I guess, is to, is to say. Very good point. Stu. Uh, I think it's a challenge that we've had for a long time, which is um, allowing everyone to play their positions. Um, you know, we're in a really interesting place because we're always coming with brand financing, so we lead with the showrunner, and we try to get as far along as we can before the ad sales folks find out about it. Because the minute the ad sales folks find out about it, it turns into a dramatically different deal. And there's, you know, it, it's too bad. Because as more of an alternative financier than we have to, you know, buy our way on to whatever the, the, ch the channel or platform might be. But the, that's all starting to, to wind itself down. And, and, you know, I agree that the, the challenge of, of planning and not over planning to know what the next platform might be and to make sure you've got enough anchor points to get your story out there um, is an ongoing one. Mm -hmm. Larry. Sure. Probably will, will offend some people, but what the hell. Uh, our, ours is kind of different because we deal on a global basis and, you know, we look at things as like now political risk. So right now, you know, our biggest challenge is how we get the leaders of both the U.S. and China mainly guys to stop playing this game of who's got the bigger thing and start doing what's best for the world. This trade war is absurd, hurts the U.S., hurts China, makes no sense, but it's just a bunch of guys, you know, letting their egos get in the way of their brains, so. Vote a woman. Ms. Meskin. 
For us, I think the biggest challenge is, um, you had mentioned Kimberly, lowest common denominator in film, but there's still a lowest common denominator on social audiences. And so there's a constant balancing act between when you're trying to prove to potential investors, mm. to potential partners, that you have these big, flashy, huge billions of viewers. And so are you going to be creating a lot of like really kind of junk food content that makes people really excited and gets the largest Im number of impressions possible? Or are you trying to invest more resources into creating something impactful? And obviously we try to do both all the time, and I personally am always trying to like pursue a personal mission of making the world better through the content that I attach my name to. Okay. Um, but I think it is a constant balancing act and a struggle for a lot of startup and digital companies to be able to like go up into the left, uh, up into the right on all metrics. I completely appreciate it. Very good point. I'd like to open up uh, questions to the audience. Who is our brave first person? I can't see anybody. That guy. Do you guys have any advice on how to, like, what the sort of recipe is to tell a narrative in a very sort of quick period from 7 to 15 seconds? Make it good. Might depend on the age of your audience. I guess, well, 7 to 15 seconds is quick, so don't try to tell multiple stories. Tell the A story, not the A, B story. Like, don't try to layer in a bunch <laughs> in that. Like, keep the backstory out of those seven <laughs> seconds. Um, I heard somebody say in terms of digital, they just like, once the payoff has happened, they get out. And I think so you almost have to start, start right before and then just happen and let it go. Um, which from a traditional storyteller is challenging because you want to build the world. Um, but imagine the world is already built and start there. Good line. I'm not sure, I can't hear the, couldn't hear the question. Well, I think a, a number of these fine people fancy themselves content creators. No, oh. I, I represent 30 directors. Okay. They're feature film directors or content directors. Um, I have three companies, and depending on, and I have to, like, it, like, it's just scale. I have three different companies with different scales. Guys who do the 17 seconds or five seconds or four seconds tend to be younger, you know, more predator type guys as opposed to the film guys that I have in my bigger company who love to do those long six minute pieces which <laughs> very far few of me. I just did one so I'm very happy with that one but it, it, it you know and we're always looking because there's always the you know I've gone from having the really high-end film guys to some kid that just graduated from college it really and anywhere in between so we're always looking and I think yeah. Everybody's looking. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, we can't hear the question, so you will repeat the question. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, she wanted to know what the relationship of the panelists was to uh, content creators across a variety of digital media formats. Is that a fair synopsis? Okay. We regularly work with outside creators, um, producers, editors, writers, so if you're interested in pop culture content, you can come talk to me after. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, we have a feature film that um, we have some people attached to, and we want to start creating digital content in order to market the film before we start to shoot. We, we, have, um, we have a musician, and so basically we want to start creating a buzz around that as a character, not the original, not the real life persona. Um, is that something that you guys think you suggest? We have the money to make it illegal. We want to be able to now go in and say we've got a following. We're giving music away. This is kind of a persona going into the new movie. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's something that you guys would suggest. That I wouldn't do it. No. No. Because if you have the money to do it, I mean, it's a perception. A couple of years ago, I was doing. 
She didn't hear the question. Okay, uh, the, the, the question itself is, uh, there's a film that's been created, there's a film that's funded, and the question was whether or not to start seeding social media with original music specific to a character in the film who is a well-known performer outside of the film. Ish. Ish. Indi in Indie-ish, not India-ish. <laughs> not Indian. <laughs> But you probably got some IP issues. I think it's risky. Yeah, I, I think it's risky because you're putting yourself out before you actually. It's up, so I get this great story I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you the punchline before I get to it. It's very risky. I, I've had directors that have done that, and it's backfired. Um, we, were some, we were going to do the Reborn of Zorro, and the studio asked me to do a 30 minute teaser, a 30 second teaser of it. And we did it, it came out great. They didn't like it. He never got to do the project, and it, it was the same situation. He had the money, he had the script, and he shot himself in the foot. It's very risky. I'm thinking, we've got a spare microphone here. Why, if you've got a question, why don't you come on up, since uh, apparently we're not projecting loudly enough for the uh, rest of the audience members. Uh, just on that, um, I think it depends. I, I agree with you, it is definitely risky just in terms of if you don't do it well, yeah. you might actually end up hurting your project more than helping it. But I also think that um, there's definitely opportunities if you do it smartly. Um, what is this movie? Uh, it was a Paul Feig movie with Blake Lively and Simple Life. There was a very, very, in my opinion, a super smart social campaign that Blake Lively did. She deleted her entire Instagram, and it just said, what happened to Emily? It got written up, there's all of these people, so I think you can certainly create assets and you can, you can create a campaign that drives buzz. This was five or six months before the movie came out. It was even before they'd even announced it, but if you look at it, there was all of these Google searches about like, what happened? Did she and Ryan Reynolds divorce? Like, and it just created a world. Um, but I don't think, <coughs> think thematically, less about content that can be judged. So if there's themes from the project that you're working on and you can think about how to tie, again, an emotion, um, an emotion or a story to, to the, that can attach to your film, I think that that's a way to utilize digital assets to help drive buzz. The only thing that I would say in terms of the, the thing you really shouldn't do is it's really hard to build a digital audience. So if you're promising that you've got this following, unless the artist that you're working with has one, building, a, building an audience from scratch, that will likely be the bigger <coughs> challenge that you'd face. I think we're taking on the next question. And um, yes, we're going to have you improvise my stand. <laughs> Period pieces, <laughs> like, Hi there. Uh, like Deadwood, um, three, three seasons on the air, got plug pulled because it was up against, it was right after Entourage, which was a 30 second, 30 minute commercial. Um, shows like Rome and other period pieces. You said something about, this isn't about putting product in there, it's about having story and having the brands behind the story I'm really interested in more specifics about how to go about doing that with period pieces. And, and, and what's, the, what's the brand's reason to want to get involved in the period pieces and what's, their, what's the payoff to them? Uh, well, the, the, the payoff to brand, brands don't have enough assets to, um, to get the scale they need to talk to their customers, <coughs> right? They, you know, back when I was, uh, when I was coming up, on Madison Avenue, was, our job was pretty easy. We'd spend uh, three months uh, in strategic developments, three months in creative de development, three months shooting commercials. You know, typically uh, there would always be a palm tree somewhere in the commercials so that we can get out of New York in February. And then we were kind of had a light summer um, because you only needed to make six commercials. But now, you know, the last program we did threw off 300 assets 
off of a web series. And it was, you know, it was a web series that could roll up to a half hour TV show. It could be a web series. It, could, it was a Facebook campaign. It was a Twitter campaign. It was a Snap campaign. All of those things come together. So when you look at it from a brand's perspective, they're paying for a creative product once, but they can use it in at least five or six different channels all the way down to retail. Um, and, and that's what only Hollywood can do. You can't take a 30 second commercial idea and go the other way. You can only take a, um, a, a, a television or film or a long format idea and, and peel it out the other way. So that's really what's in it for the, the marketers, um, provided the marketers can let the creative team do their job and, and realize that they're a little over their skis when they have to give notes on a script because they can't give notes like they're used to doing on a 30 second uh, commercial. Now Larry, you've got a classic period <coughs> piece that you're looking. Yeah, Larry, you have a <coughs> classic Was that just period for period piece? piece? Or am I gonna that uh, you're looking to develop yeah, and I'm, I'm, What's your I'm doing a movie called Empress, which is about the first woman ruler of China. It takes place about 1,200 years ago. So it's kind of hard to find products that easily fit in. So what we found that we, we, we did, and we're actually doing this pretty successfully, is we reached out to brands and people and got them to design new products that could actually fit in the movie. So in, the, in this movie called Empress, she has great skin. So I found a skincare company that is gonna, so in the movie we have a beautiful urn, she sends the army to the desert to get the clay and stuff. So in the movie you'll see this beautiful urn, but we now have a skincare company that's making the replica of that beautiful urn and it'll be sold at Sephora. Um, there was uh, at Metball for um, fashion. Uh, last year Rihanna wore a great dress called the Empress dress. Um, so I found a designer who designed that who happens to be Chinese. So she's creating all the gowns that'll be in the, the movie for the Empress, but working with a Chinese manufacturer is then making a consumer line inspired by Empress. And we just did the same thing, we just did deal with a uh, jewelry designer. So in the movie, we're gonna have products that were created specifically for the movie that fit the period. So a lot harder, but doable. Okay. And Rachel, on, on you know, period detail? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's a little bit off our genre, but... <laughs> Not a problem. Um, here we go. I was going to say you could have it uh, sponsored by Trump tariffs, the, the Chinese uh, period piece. Um, but uh, actually, I wanted to know if you had one thing each of you could say that is like your biggest lesson or your biggest, like, you know, don't fall into this, you know, thing or, you know, here's the thing that'll really help you. What would you say? Sure, I, I get it. Mine would be uh, really know how to analyze your own stuff and know when to let go. I find I have like 10 bad ideas for every decent one I have, but my real skill is looking at them and saying, you know what, this sounded good, you know, when I woke up this morning, but it's really stupid. And people spend their time trying to stick with stuff just because their ego drives them to think everything they do is good. It's analyze and let go and move on to the one that can work. I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins, but believe in yourself and don't be afraid of technology because that, that seems to be the challenge is it's moving so quick that you get intimidated and you don't understand. Um, and really, those, if you believe in yourself, that's, that's not, you know, don't stop. I mean, if you really want to do this, it ain't easy. You got to just, you have to have the perf perseverance to do it. Sir. I just want to... Uh, I would echo those two, and I would say um, don't take yourself too seriously and don't think that failure is a stopping point. Like, we fail constantly. That's specifically with how fast everything's moving. If you're not failing, you're not working hard enough. Uh, my, my watch out is always don't over-engineer. I mean, we've... <laughs> We, we've attempted to go into every new technology, new platform, everything else, and you end up sp wasting a lot of money and a lot of energy, mm -hmm. when if you actually just focus on the basics, you usually get where you need to be. 
I would say all of that and don't be afraid to experiment. Um, data is everything and, mm -hmm. and knowing um, what an iterative process and why it works is, is important, but sometimes you have to do something completely bonkers because it might work. Going now. Hi, I uh, just wanted to talk about the dangers of brand convergence with like really insider stuff. Just, just to preface this, for about 27 years I've been generating adult animation content with a, a studio that I've owned and th that's actually finally going really well because it's in vogue, but that took 27 years. Uh, I just built a company that kind of has put a monopoly stamp on skateboarding going into its first inclusion in the 2020 Olympics. So the, this, this company is designed to interface with brands, but if you remember what happened with snowboarding after its first inclusion in the Olympics, all of a sudden there was this high swing, high exposure, ended in essentially its death, so to speak. So can we talk a little bit about the dangers implied with interacting to a very insider sport in this case, or insider anything with larger brands? Is snowboarding dead now? Is snowboarding dead now? No. I think, I think it's, um, again, it's, it's just making sure that you're creating the right relationship with the brand, you know, so if there's a, a you know, there, there'll be plenty, the watch out is the large brand that's trying, gonna try to use skateboarding to make themselves cool. Like, you need, you need a brand that's already in the know a little bit mm -hmm. in order to make that successful. And again, knowing your market. I mean, cricket is well known everywhere else but these 48 contiguous states. So if you know your market, um, you're going to find a sponsor. That's not going to be an issue. Hi, Ranjit Music Tribes. I started with entertainment as social impact, which is a participation thing. I was with them two months ago. Okay. So the idea is when we realize 80% of our revenue models are international, global. So you touched on something interesting where why aren't more countries and communities creating content? We have the tools. We have AI that does web crawlers, does sampling of audiences, and provides today the tools to create a show. Using some of the tools currently available is significant mm -hmm. and takes it to a whole new level. But I don't see too many of the marketing advertising people talking mm -hmm. about the power of AI and web crawlers to hijack the experience of branding. As I'm, not, I'm not sure the question. Uh, using artificial intelligence yeah. to hijack branding? Yeah, what artificial intelligence and machine learning does sampling learning. around the world mm -hmm. in real time. They go to a lot of the social media networks and pick up data and make it available to brand ambassadors. So I'm looking at this and understanding that majority of uh, revenue is coming from overseas through the networks. So why aren't more people doing what, like what you're doing with uh, uh, participation media? Uh, I, think, I think people are. I think it's just slower moving. Um, I think that, uh, you know, international um, I think U.S. companies, and I think Larry can probably speak to this the best, to say that you know international uh, or U.S. companies are are working very actively to make inroads in international markets. Uh, as far as the AI component, I don't know if I'm exactly the person <laughs> to explain how or why people aren't doing <laughs> doing that. so many different formats. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I mean we like I said we're distributing digitally, so a lot of that is happening. Mm -hmm. A lot of what YouTube and, and Facebook are doing is all AI, and, and even in terms of switching uh, languages um, and this, uh, excuse me, subtitling, <coughs> there's a lot of AI that's happening. I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. though. <coughs> I could answer it without AI. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, a lot of, uh, up until very recently, within the last 20 years, I mean, this was a US-centric world in terms of entertainment. Mm -hmm. So people who really understood how to create stuff that people actually put their butt in a chair and watch uh, typically came out of the U.S. I mean, we control 90% of the world market. That's changed dramatically, but the, the creative communities in all these countries hasn't quite developed as quickly as, as the market appetite and stuff. So like you take China, where they have tremendous ability to, 
to pump out huge things with cast of 10,000s, their storytelling ability is in the garbage because they, they really don't have a history of storytelling and stuff. It will take a generation because right now, you know, everybody in China who's writing grew up in an educational system based on rote memory, not on creativity. So some of the stuff will catch up. It's just that, you know, you've got to wipe out the last hundred years of America-centric uh, in order for other countries to catch up. This is an opposite question. This is a very low IQ question, which uh, I'm a writer-producer, worked at both studio and indie level. We're developing lots of material from books that we own, over 300 for, by established writers from, for TV and film. Who are the gatekeepers to these branding associations? How do we get in the door? Larry, you've probably, uh, you, it seems you're very good at this, but also for Ed and Stuart, you know, and uh, whatever the traditional door is, what's the back door? Because that's usually the one you get in, I've found. You want me to go first? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> sure, what we do here, I mean, now, again, against my better judgment, I'm doing more stuff in the U.S. now, because this trade war has slowed China down a bit. Um, so we go out, we find these brand opportunities, we pitch the brands. Um, directly to the brands? Yeah, we pitch directly to the brands or the agencies. And then when we deal with the, the Netflix or the Amazons of the world, okay, we use some of that money to offset license fees. So when we're dealing with the Netflix, we actually go on a world from a deal they can't refuse because we've already got part of the production covered through other ways. And that's the way we get in. We take the same approach. We go brand direct. Um, and who at the brand? Who do you, who's the gatekeeper? And see, brand? Every brand is yeah, different. It's a marketing, the, the, the marketing, marketing department. department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Like I said, a low IQ question, but thank no, you. That was terrific. <laughs> that's, that's very helpful. And this is our last question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so I come from old school traditional integrations. I started integrations at MTV back with the real world to tell you how old it is. Um, and I've done everything all these years, soup to nuts, from ideation to execution. Um, in this current job market, what I'm finding is that a lot of people want people who are ideators or executors only. So when they come across someone like me, who's on both sides of the fence, it's often challenging for me to rise to the, to the top of the, um, the cup. How do you suggest I position myself as an integrated marketer to um, brands or potentially other uh, distribution outlets to uh, perform in that role? Um, <clears throat> so the, one of the reasons I left the U.S. was exactly for this thing is everybody just in the studios has their head up their butt. Um, and, and no, it makes it very hard, you know, for people like you who bring a wealth of experience. So, you know, I chosen to get out of this country, um, although now I've kind of been forced back in, because you'll find that out of this country, it's much more open. Um, and by bringing in your, that experience, I mean, particularly in places like China, I mean, they just love you there. And just for a point, counterpoint, uh, Rachel and I share a not-for-profit and for-profit background. At PBS, we were encouraged to be multitaskers. You wrote and produced and shot and <coughs> edited and funded your own pieces, which for me, in the ad with the advent of digital media, has been a huge opportunity. I've run my own company since 1995, juggling all. So it kind of depends on the markets you're going after. And distance learning is a huge opportunity around the world. And the whole... The, the biggest opportunity within distance learning is making it, is gamifying it, is making it interesting, making it palpable, and making it pertinent. So I think that, that you've got um, two different schools of thought that you can pursue. I would agree with that. If you're not going through the studio system, well-rounded people are an asset. I know sometimes when we hire, we're looking for a unicorn, yeah. where it's like this person can, we really need somebody point. who can do it all. And right now we have a, a lot of specialists, so I actually think that's an asset and a strength. <coughs> I think that if you're approaching, if you're approaching people, one, I'm always kind of like, a, just do it yourself, just make your own, make your own way, uh, which is you know comes with significantly worse health insurance. But um, 
I think that um, approaching and, and approaching people as the great problem solver, everybody that's hiring has a problem that they're trying to solve. So instead of focusing on the fact that you're either an ideator or an executor, you solve problems. That's what you're here for. It's like, you got a problem? Guess what? I'm the solution. I think it's really hard to, um, it's hard to argue with that. Find something you mentioned earlier, focus. Focus, find something to focus your attention on that specifically you're passionate about. Because that will drive you, you know. Because even, even, you know, cause it's trying to get a, a job in this environment is very difficult. So you got to figure out what is it that drives you and is going to create that passion to pursue it. But I appreciate your question. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, this phenomenal panel. Ed Ribeiro. Thank you. Alayo Lasaki. Stuart McLean.